So there we go. I'm delighted to welcome everyone this afternoon to our first virtual workshop dedicated to the topic of writing larger projects as a graduate student. Um, I'm especially delighted because we are presenting this workshop in collaboration and partnership with one of our current PhD students here at UTEP. And that means that we um, get to have a bit of peer support along the way for one of the most pernicious questions that faces us as graduate students, which is how to tackle those larger projects from your thesis to your dissertation to uh, your capstone projects, um, grant applications, whatever they may be. We hope that the workshop today will be a great resource for you. Um, I'm Shannon Connolly. I'm the Assistant Dean of the Graduate School here at UTEP. And I'm joined today by a few colleagues from the Graduate School who I would love to introduce to you quickly. Uh, one of them is to my right on the screen, uh, Sal Dominguez, who is a PhD student in the Interdisciplinary Health Sciences Program and a graduate assistant with us in the Graduate School. Also, uh, Lourdes Jimenez, uh, who is an undergraduate student in biochemistry and an undergraduate assistant in the graduate school. And last but not least, I'm joined by our presenter, uh, Turnip Van Dyke, who is waving to us all now. Um, Turnip is a PhD student in the Rhetoric and Writing Studies program here at UTEP. Um, they have worked in a variety of roles supporting students in higher education, including as a writing consultant and a teacher here at UTEP. And uh, that writing consultant project, I'm really proud to say, is something that Turnip worked on in collaboration with the Graduate School last year. So they have quite a bit of experience as a peer mentor um, and advocate for students' writing here at UTEP. Um, so I would like to just again remind everyone a little bit of, of Zoom etiquette. Please remember uh, to mute your microphones if you haven't already. And leave those muted during the presentation, but of course, feel free to um, unmute yourself if you'd like to pose a question directly to the group or the presenter when we get to those points. And feel free to turn on your webcam if you like at any point during the presentation. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Turnip to get us started. All right. Thank you, Shannon. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, as Shannon mentioned, we are going to move through a presentation that I'll be presenting and then during that, if you have any questions coming up, please feel free to use the chat. We're also going to have a Q&A session a little bit after, and that'll be a time if you want to use microphone instead. Um, but we'll have some people looking at chat and making sure that I can see it even with screen share on and all of that. But yeah, let's go ahead and hop into the presentation. So um, as mentioned, this presentation is focused on, and I have to get my screen share so that to get my big head out of the way. There we go. Um, this is focused on writing large projects as a graduate student. And as Shannon mentioned, by that, what we're meaning is looking at any kind of projects I'm envisioning as ones that, like, you know, take quite a while to do. And so um, ones that really are not viable to get done within like a week or maybe they're things that like involve an intense amount of collaboration such as grant applications often do um, and really demand writing across a, a longer period of time and thinking through a project with writing um, either in stages or writing is necessary to conceiving of the project for you know more than like five pages or something. Um, that can be applicable to a lot of different kind of documents that we look at in graduate school, uh, whether that's, you know, for humanities folks, maybe end of term papers, all the way through to like much larger capstone thesis dissertation kind of work. Um, and certainly work from here as a professional or as a scholar um, in which you may be engaging in large scale complicated writing projects. What I'm hoping that um, folks will be able to get out of this session is really identifying some tools that may help with particular issues that you are experiencing with writing large projects or that you're anticipating that you will run into. Tools to address that generally. I, I can't promise 100% like fix it rate on this, though certainly we're wanting to identify resources that you can follow up with and continue to work through any issues that you're encountering. And that's also part of why I'm encouraging that um, people use the chat function during this presentation to chime in as we're moving through stuff. If you have insights or if you're just wanting to share that, like, you know, I, I am also experiencing um, X issue or something, we do want to hear that. 
I think it helps people understand like, oh, this problem isn't just mine, but a large number of people are experiencing that. I wanted to keep this up on the screen for a second, especially since we're recording. This is the uh, link to the presentation itself. We'll also be sending this out later. Um, but if for any reason you want to follow along for this, um, this is the link itself. Um, I forgot to put this in chat, so I'm just gonna do that really quick before we move forward um, in case anybody during this would like to follow along that way. Thanks for that turn up. I also wanted to let you know that I think we're seeing still your slides in not in the presentation view. Okay, good to know. I will I will try and work on that then. Okay, um, and then I see a chat from Tokemi Alejo really quick. Can you email the Zoom? Yes, we are planning to email the Zoom recording um, and then people can share that out from there. Absolutely. Okay, so let's go back into screen share and see if I can't, you know, um, succeed this time <laughs> at making sure we're in presentation mode. Here we go. This is uh, apparently Firefox wants to do this today, so we're going to stick with it. Um, okay, so I like to start uh, sort of larger writing workshops with a small activity that I think will both help kind of ground us and um, give us a first tool to kind of start thinking about as we're moving into this. So I like to start that activity by reading this quote from Toni Morrison. Writers all devise ways to approach that place where they expect to make the contact, where they become the conduit, or where they engage in this mysterious process. For me, light is the signal in the transition. It's not being in the light, it's being there before it arrives. It enables me in some sense. I tell my students one of the most important things they need to know is when they are at their best creatively. They need to ask themselves, what does the ideal room look like? Is there music? Is there silence? Is there chaos outside or is there serenity outside? What do I need in order to release my imagination? So if you're comfortable, take a moment and close your eyes. And just the initial kind of thinking activity that I like to have is take a moment and, and think through the questions that uh, Toni Morrison just posed in that quote for us. What is an ideal room for you look like in terms of the work and practice of writing? What is a space that you work well in? Do you have some music on? Um, are you surrounded by other people? Are you alone by yourself? Is this magically like a desk in the forest? Where, where is this ideal space for you to be able to work on this writing? So go ahead and open back up your eyes. Um, and we're gonna be drawing on this sense of an ideal room a couple times as we work through um, the issues that I'm presenting that can come up with writing. But in general, you know, the broadest thing to kind of ask yourself is like, what elements of that ideal room can I bring into my current work? Like what are things that I can change either about the environment I'm in or how I'm approaching the work that get closer to that ideal environment for me and what makes it to quote the image here, just my type. So, and sort of, just, if I may, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm going to play my interrupter role, put on my interrupter Great, perfect. Role. Thank I'm you. looking at the chat and I, I see the same thing, Pamela. Um, mm -hmm. Pamela says, my slide is still on the link. So, what we're seeing is still. Oh, I apologize. Slide number two. Is this better now? I can work through it this way. Can people see things better now? Yes. So, now we I apologize. Six. So, thank you so much. Okay, so this is the quote from Toni Morrison that I was reading. Um, I swear I was moving along with some slides. So hopefully people were still able to listen along for the ideal room portion. I'll leave this up for a little second longer in case anybody on the recording later wants to read through that. Um, and I will just move through the uh, presentation this way and I apologize for that technical issue right now. So um, here's sort of the overview of what we'll be working on through this workshop and kind of thinking through together. Um, it's in general that writing larger projects uh, necessitate some complications with them and we want to anticipate those and look at some tools and resources around those. In particular, we're wanting to hone in on the fact that writing large projects can require you to write in unfamiliar formats or genres. Um, they can take complicated approaches. They can ask you to take complicated approaches to your thinking um, and ask you to second guess your ideas. They can ask you to write in your non-native language. They can ask you to spend a lot of time over months or years on the same work. And they can ask you to be alone frequently, um, even or especially when you can't. Um, and that was something that came up while we were preparing this workshop, getting comment and feedback and a reminder in terms of like, uh, 
this particular moment with uh, the COVID-19 um, social distancing and quarantine still going on, many people are spending a lot of time, obviously, either with family members or people that they're living with that makes it a little bit more complicated to have the space that you might otherwise want to write in. So we'll be discussing that. So let's hop on in with that first one, which was the writing in unfamiliar genres. And for each of these, I've kind of found a question that I have come across when discussing um, these kinds of issues with uh, graduate students on how they're tackling writing projects. And in this one, it's just the bewilderment of what is this even supposed to look like? You may be asked with a thesis or a dissertation to write a kind of document that you have not before. Um, obviously, grant applications can vary quite a bit in terms of the demands of them. And so I'm going to go through a couple things here of like approaches that you could take to, to kind of go about familiarizing yourself with this. And this is an active kind of pre-writing step that you can take or, you know, if you're already in the project taking now to give yourself an idea of how other people have approached this similar kind of work. So, for example, for capstones or theses or dissertations, looking at previous documents, either from your program or ones that um, fit a similar approach to yours, can be really worthwhile so that you can see how other people have tried to take this on. So, we have the UTEP ScholarWorks website where you can search um, online theses or uh, dissertations that students have made available previously. And then I'd also encourage you, you know, if you're working with an advisor, or you're working with, say, on grants, a colleague who is familiar with this organization already, ask them for examples of work that has already com been completed that looks like this. And this can be, you know, for much smaller writing projects too. I think this can come up this way, like students, for example, may be really unfamiliar with what a CV looks like because you haven't, you know, been on a hiring committee to help hire academics who have to have a CV. And so you're like, what? what does this even look like? Why would I want to do this? Like asking people to see a CV to get a sense of what the sections are, what they're approaching can be really good. And getting that sense can come up through an approach that I refer to as reverse outlining. I've included a link here that um, will go to a page that walks you through reverse outlining quite a bit. But in a nutshell, what we're looking at with reverse outlining is the notion of taking an already written work, reading through it, and then breaking it down into its structural components. So moving it back into that stage where we might just have a bullet point list, or we might just have like, in the intro, they say this, and this section, they say this kind of thing. So that you have an understanding of what the sections are of the document and how, or, or what the person chose to focus on in each of those sections. So they can get a sense of like, what they chose to prioritize, when they prioritize in the document, how much, you know, writing or space they gave to each of those. These can be really helpful things to tackle this, what is it supposed to look like kind of question. Um, before we're moving on to the next slide, are there any comments or thoughts coming up in relation to this one? Not seeing any chat comments on this slide, but I wanted to mention to everyone that as, as Turnip is going through the presentation, if you see links on the screen, we're gonna try to also post them in the chat. So you'll have them handy if you want to click them and save it in a new tab just as you follow along. Thank you so much. That would be perfect. Okay. And this next one, we have uh, the subject of, I don't even like my topic anymore, being stuck with a topic for a long period of time. Not being stuck, committing to a topic that hopefully you have some genuine passion and interest in and have wanted to pursue for a reason. Right, and this can especially come up with, you know, these longer projects like a thesis or a dissertation where you are being asked to possibly for the first time in, in your career, sit with a research project for quite a while and, you know, watch the field kind of move around it and move with it, including the ever fun experience of thinking about a research topic for quite a while and then running into a research article published newly in a journal that you read and you're like, well, it feels like they just did my research for me. What am I even doing? And all those kind of fun moments. Um, and what I would say to this is the first notion here is perfection is a trap. You are not writing this document to make the single best contribution to knowledge that anybody has ever made. You are writing this to demonstrate and work through your capacity to engage in a longer research topic. Or with a grant application or something, you are writing to a time limit. You are writing to get things done efficiently as part of other work. Um, so, you know, don't catch yourself in, in this moment in which you feel that you must uh, perfect this in every way. At some point, good enough 
is the goal and is what you're trying to work towards. If you're wanting to look for other ways to kind of refresh your work because it's growing stale rather than you getting frustrated with it or feeling like it's not reaching a height that you want it to, I've suggested a couple of ways here that you could like um, just refresh it for yourself or find other ways to restate it. So uh, I've suggested free writing or journaling here. So just actually with this prompt of thinking about how you're thinking about this topic has evolved over time. Like in really brief and like more general terms than you would use in a more formal paper or something, how has your experience with this topic changed from when you first encountered it through to the research you've done? Um, and now how is your understanding of it changed in some way? You can be surprised, but just thinking through your personal connection with it can be, or asking somebody to sit down and like have a dinner conversation with you or something about this can also be helpful in a similar way. I've also highlighted the three minute thesis competition, which I believe UTEP has um, led before, um, but certainly there are other ones both nationally and around the world. The three minute thesis and short is this idea of, um, presenting your entire thesis in a three minute presentation. So really having to boil down to the essence um, of what you were discussing in your thesis or dissertation and presenting it to a generalist audience. And so how do you get to the major points and how do you convey their significance to people who might otherwise be completely unfamiliar with your field? And that can be a really refreshing way to like, oh, I, I need to look at this for a whole new audience and I need to look at this in a new way. Um, and trying to get back into those kind of like beginner eyes. And then finally on here, I have the suggestion, and, and this is certainly something to work through with an advisor, or if this is a work-related matter, working with a supervisor or somebody else before you try this out, but taking intentional time away, like walking away for like, you know, whether that's just a couple of days or a full week or something where like, I, I need to not touch this. I'm going to work on other things and give my brain time to actually refresh on what's going on. Or this could be on a smaller scale, um, especially since we're talking about larger writing projects where maybe you're only taking time away from, you know, your methods section that you've just worked way too hard on uh, and your brain is just kind of stuck on what to do next. Put it in the proverbial drawer for like a month and, and step away from it. Work on other parts of your, your writing or your research before returning to that with a refreshed and renewed sense of purpose for it. And then let's go ahead and pop on to the next one if anything isn't coming up right yet. Okay, there we go. So this one is, um, as I mentioned, the, the request to like write it either in your non-native language or just not feeling confident in your English capabilities for any reason um, can be summed up with the phrase that I've certainly heard many times of my English isn't good or I'm not a good writer. Um, and one thing that I would kind of center first and foremost in this is like it, I wouldn't fret about this a whole lot. Like this is something that you can work on. These are skills that you can get. And at the end of the day, what's making somebody a good writer is their ability to express thoughts, not their ability to like engage in kind of grammar or mechanics. These are detail oriented things that, you know, I've, I've certainly been in conversations where I've argued with people like, I think this is the last like 2% of, of a project is polishing and proofreading uh, the sentence level things uh, versus the, you know, these big ideas and all this research that you've already done, which make up 98% of the work. And you need to validate yourself for that. that. That is a part of writing and that's something that you are accomplished at and are an expert at already, right? Um, but some ideas here for you to go ahead and kind of look at if you are wanting to work more for this grammar and mechanics angle or working to quote unquote sound more like a natural English speaker, which I have lots of thoughts on that we don't have time to get into in this workshop. Um, but the top bullet point here, I'm suggesting share your writing with peers. Um, I've highlighted one here, which is go to the University Writing Center on campus. Uh, the, I worked there this past year in the 20. 19, uh, sorry, 2018, 19 uh, academic year. And that was a great experience to get to work directly with graduate students, also working through the graduate school for that. Um, but graduate students are welcome to come in just as undergraduate students are to work on stuff. It's not a proofreading service in the sense of like, the point is not to drop off a paper and have it come back better. The point is to work with you as a consultant on the, the writing tasks that you are struggling with or want to think through with somebody else in some way. So in this case, it's, it's not so much that they are going to proofread it for you as 
they want to work with you on developing some stronger proofreading skills that you can take on then. Um, another one that I forgot to highlight here in the slide is we did introduce the, through the graduate school the new graduate student peer writing groups this semester. Um, those are getting started and those are intended for students working on these kind of larger projects. I think we just sent out uh, the first round of like welcome to the group kind of emails this past week to get those going, but those would be peer writing groups that are peer led where you're meeting either weekly or every other week or so together to um, either read your writing together or in some way support each other through these larger projects. So those are definitely options for getting other eyes on your work for these kind of writing mechanic skills that I've definitely heard anecdotally from some people that, you know, maybe your advisors or your department are just you feel like are not preparing or are not prepping you for in some way. The other one that I've highlighted here, and this is similar to um, previously the what is it supposed to look like slide where we we're talking about familiarization. I'm encouraging you to think about what, what are the sort of like moves writer makes, uh, writers make, or what are the writing moves experts in your field want to engage with? And so like, what are the keywords or what are the phrases that they turn to? And not just in a jargon sense, but also like what are the common ways that they're structuring their arguments? Um, I have a book recommendation here if somebody is really wanting to dive into this a little bit more. This is uh, oriented towards an undergraduate audience, but I think it's really handy for exactly this kind of work. It's called They Say, I Say, The Moves That Matter in Academic Writing. Um, and it focuses on like, what are these kind of phrases that introduce your topic or like, how can you uh, disagree with somebody and what are some common ways in English academic writing that people do that? And they'll have actually sample sentences or almost quote unquote like sentence templates for you to kind of like try out and use as a way to get an idea of how to go about doing that. Is anybody having some thoughts or comments about this? I know this is a pretty important topic to a lot of people. I don't see any questions posted in the chat, but maybe sure. if you want to pause for a beat and see if anyone yeah. um, has a question that occurs to them. Again, yeah, definitely. post them in the chat at any time. Just take a quick, quick breather. And again, um, we are posting links to some of these resources in the chat. So you'll have them there in the meanwhile before we share the slides with you. All right, I'm gonna get going on the next slide. If you are in the midst of writing a, a beautiful comment, go ahead and finish that and I'll get interrupted and we'll, we'll return to it. Okay, so this next one is about writing and writing and writing over a long period of time or the exasperated expression, this project is just never going to end. Um, and this can feel like something that you have just been working on for what feels like far too long there's not really an end in sight, or you're not really sure how, how it is that you're supposed to be managing such a large scale kind of thing. You might be much more used to writing as this thing that I get done in one evening. Like, you know, I think through my draft in my head for a while, and then one evening in like three hours, I just kind of bang it out, and then I'm done, and I don't have to touch that paper again. And we're talking about projects where it's either too complex or just demands too much work to get that done in that kind of evening. And so here I want to give just a suggestion at the start of some time management goals or um, and I think we can break that down both into approaching it from the timing aspect and in the what are you doing with that time aspect. And I'll start there with with just this basic statement of making small goals, like make yourself small achievable goals for a day, like knowing the amounts of time that you have to work on writing like productively and successfully. What is a reasonable goal to set for yourself on any given day with this writing project. It's probably not, I'm going to write this entire chapter of this research, but instead it might be like, I'm going to go back and revise this part of the section, or I'm going to make sure that the citations in this area are looking good. Um, or, you know, I'm really going to bang out like two pages today. I know I had a professor in undergrad who talked about how he did his dissertation that way, where he was just like, I just wrote two pages every day <laughs> for like six months. And that was like how he kept going through it. It was either write two pages or revise two pages. And that was just his rhythm and what really worked well for him. Um, 
One way that you could do this is use a dissertation calculator. I've included a link to one here. There are others online if you want to look up that idea. But this is really just a plug in what your timeline is and what your goals are for a dissertation. And this will spit out some suggestions for how you could break up that time or that schedule using some pretty traditional ideas of what a dissertation might be. Obviously, you could then personalize that for yourself or just make your own in terms of like actually set out uh, smaller, more attainable goals, either that's daily or weekly or something that will give you a sense of progress and momentum with something that otherwise is just like there's there's too much to tackle. There's like a proverbial statement for that of like, um, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And then the other thing, contrary to eating an elephant is make this a more pleasant experience for yourself. Like, let's go back to that ideal room idea and really think about elements that you can start incorporating of like, what is an ideal environment for you to work in that will make this more viable, more pleasant. So if part of this is just the frustration of I've been doing this work so long and I just have to keep doing it kind of thing, like what can make that a more pleasant experience? Is that, you know, um, some people like to dedicate themselves to snacks. I have a friend who, she um, is a novelist in her free time and she motivates herself to like work on these large creative novels with the motivation of snacks that she only eats when she's writing. I think it's like pretzels and M&Ms together or something. But like if you have a snack that you really like, like try to make it only a writing kind of treat or some, some other way to kind of trick your brain into that. Or it could be just as nice as like, I would like um, some fairy lights or some Christmas lights in the room where I work so that I have a pleasant lighting environment or those kinds of things. And then let's pop on. This one is definitely related in, in that environment sense of writing can be really lonely. And don't worry, we're gonna get to the other end of the spectrum where I don't have time to be alone in just a second. But um, writing is really lonely um, or making solitary work social. So, ah, this is where I put the peer writing groups. Great, we talked about these a little bit already, but I wanted to highlight again, um, this is something the graduate school is doing right now. It is a resource that you can hop into if you would like. Um, I know they only just got going. I saw some names uh, from the participants of people who are participating in these. Um, but again, since we only just got them going, I don't know that they can really chime in with their experiences with it yet. Um, but I am excited to see how that starts working for people as a way to meet other people outside of your department who can kind of like commiserate and support you on just this process of going through a large piece of writing or longer research kind of projects. Um, but along other suggestions just for this loneliness kind of piece, schedule quiet like work time with friends or family. Uh, you know, even with the COVID environment, this is something you can do over Zoom. This is something I'm teaching a first year writing class for undergraduate students right now. And something that I'm doing every week is just running an hour and a half session that they're allowed to come to that's not required. That's just basically a Zoom study hour time where they can, I'll be writing and they're welcome to work on anything that they want to. And as questions come up, that's great. But that can be sort of a, a space to feel some companionship. Um, and then along with that, uh, another kind of option if you're wanting to move beyond just your social network um, or your friends and family or just don't have the kind of work that they can really do with you um, in that setting, is contact living scholars who you are reading and citing. So, you know, if you're in a space where like you are citing active research that is going on now, possibly some of the people that you're citing are very much like alive and well and happy to hear from graduate students who are interested in their work. Like there is a magic ticket at the moment to talking to a lot of people in the world and that's starting an email with, I am a graduate student and I am interested in blank because blank. Like, it is a doorway into talking to a lot of people who may not otherwise be ready to talk to you. So don't be afraid to use that. Like, don't be afraid to like reach out and try and make that connection so that you can talk to them about their work or you can share what you've been doing based off of their work. People like talking about themselves and their work a lot of the time. So it's kind of flattering when you're like, I really enjoyed your work and I'm trying to think about this other aspect of it. Do you have any thoughts? Um, and, and as I'm kind of suggesting here, this is part of your graduate student enculturation of like, you are in graduate school, you are becoming an expert in your field, and this is a way to join in with other experts and join in dialogues with them, your questions and opinions for this matter. And then, as I mentioned, there, there is kind of the opposite 
end of this, which is, you know, you, you don't have the space or time to be lonely. Um, and I think this is exacerbated at the moment for a lot of people with um, the pandemic environment, but just this kind of question of like, when am I even supposed to write? Um, like, you know, if you have a child running in the room every five minutes, or if you are caring for um, somebody who is ill in your life or something like, how are you supposed to make time to make this work? Um, and I would suggest this is related to small goals, but plan your writing routines around some micro tasks is an initial idea I have here. So, you know, if you work better, possibly in 15 minute chunks, or that's really all you have, because you're like, I can make time in the morning and in the evening for like these two 15 minute periods of time where I just, you know, I, that's an amount of time that I can say, I have to do this. I got to keep working on this. Then, then make that the amount of time that you can work on something. Um, I've highlighted here the Pomodoro technique. Pomodoro is Italian for tomato. Um, the inventor of the technique used a tomato kitchen timer for it. That's why he calls it that. Um, but it is set up around this idea of setting a small goal and then do, working on something for a focused period of time. So traditionally that's like 25 minutes of really focused time and then five minute break and then doing chunks of that as needed. But obviously you can change the length of those as, as you want. So this could be, like really tight boundaries around that of like setting yourself timers of like, right now I'm gonna try and work through a page of writing or read through this in the next 15 minutes and whatever I get to, I get to. It's really nice with this as well. And I, I was forgetting to mention this up above, but I think sometimes, um, especially with this issue of this project is never going to end, leave yourself something to do for the next day. Like don't try to get through everything that you want with something in one day, give yourself a little bit to get yourself going the next day with something. And this is uh, with the Pomodoro technique, something that can be, work really well for that. You know, if you're really enjoying it and going for 15 minutes, you know, then go ahead and try and stop yourself because then you may have five minutes more energy or it's something that you know you're excited about the next time you get to pick it back up. Um, and then the other suggestion here is writing can happen in a lot of settings. Uh, so trying out different methods of writing, such as audio dictation, just doodling out or visualizing your ideas, just making notes on your phone or on scrap paper as needed, like thinking through that. Um, one of my favorite writers is Gloria Anzaldúa, and she is famous for saying that she got a lot of writing done on the toilet. Like she was just like, you take the time and space that you can to get this work done. Um, and then also the suggestion here, and this is kind of related to that social aspect, but like if young people are in your life are doing homework, maybe do your homework with them or present it as like, right now mom is needing to get some homework done too. Let's get our homework done together and making that a space where both of you can kind of work on something. Um, this is a slide in particular that I am certain that other people might have better ideas than I do about. Um, and, and I would love to hear about that either now with comments or as we go into Q&A. Um, but this is bringing us through the slides into a short group activity uh, that I wanted to do using the breakout rooms. So we're going to set it up so that you have about 10 minutes to talk with a few of your peers who are in the um, video call right now. And we're going to take some time to talk through these questions now that we're presenting some tools and ideas. And hopefully you all can bring some as well to the small group, but you know, identifying both your supports, identifying what UTIP resources you could start using or what tools from this presentation you could start kind of working with to get going here. Yeah, so um, I believe Shannon is going to break us out into the rooms for that. And I will go ahead and paste the, copy paste those uh, questions into the chat really quick so that everybody can still see those. Perfect. Yeah, I think if you paste them into the chat now, everyone can take a look because they may, it may be harder to see them once you go into your breakout rooms. We can also broadcast them back at the top as you're meeting together briefly. Um, so I have the breakout rooms formed. You're going to be about three to four individuals in each breakout room. And we'll leave you some time for a good conversation. Turn up, I did have a, a direct question that I think I'll save for when everyone comes back from the groups um, because it's specifically about time management and proposal okay. writing that I think could be useful to discuss after everyone has a little chance to chat. Perfect. That'll get us going with Q&A. That sounds okay. good. All right, then. If we are ready, I'm going to send you all to breakout rooms and open them now. You should see a pop-up window on your screen, and that will let you know which breakout room you've been assigned to. Just hit I forget if it's accept or join so that you'll be sent off to that room and we'll help you if you get left behind. All right.
I'm going to start bringing people back. Hi, welcome back. Here we go. Whole flood of folks. Hello, welcome back, everybody. Hello, hi. Um, okay, so really quick, I'm just going to respond to that. What is the forest app question that we had before we went on the break? The little link right there. Uh, Vivian had mentioned it. It's it's an app that uses this Pomodoro technique that I had talked about, um, and it sort of gamifies it with like you can plant seeds to like have a forest of trees, and the the trees grow by you like using this focus time kind of aspect. So it's basically encouraging you to use the 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 app to like have a pretty visualization of all the work you're doing. Um, Anyway, I, I wanted to just kind of ask if anybody from the groups wants to share through chat a couple of the insights that you all got um, from the groups, if anybody wants to chime in either with something that they had or even better, something that you were excited about that you heard from somebody else in your group that you want to just share back through the chat really quick um, so that we can see some of the ideas that were bubbling up before we jump into Q&A. Zoom is always one of those fun apps where you can't see if somebody is typing or not. So you're like, could be five people typing, could be zero. There we go. Jesse says, friends, partners, and professors in particular seem to be an excellent support system. That's great. Yes, I would I would definitely encourage you to like maintain friendships and family during this. And then um, professors, uh, both I would encourage you obviously making a close relationship with your advisor if you're talking about thesis or dissertation, um, but also professors like beyond the degree as well, it, as you take on larger projects later in your career, professors, you know, should remain a support and a mentor for you and circling back to them about their advice or their suggestions can be really good. But during this stage as well, I think being open with them uh, about the challenges you're facing and getting their insights about how they have tackled this work can be really good. And sometimes it's on you to open that space because they might not think to kind of like commiserate with you about how challenging and difficult some of this can be. Osmi noted the Writing Center, great. Uh, the library database uh, apps, including Grammarly. Yes, Grammarly is an option for sure. Purdue OWL citations. Let's go ahead and really quick, I'm gonna pull up a link to the Purdue OWL. Um, that was mentioned. So Purdue OWL is the online writing lab at Purdue University. This is an online resource for um, a lot of different citation needs. It basically has a ton of citation guides on it. Um, and so this is a great place to draw on if you have like quick questions about how am I supposed to cite a second work by the same author? How am I supposed to order them if all of these works were published in the same year? A lot of niche questions, but also just some basic things of like, what the heck does this look like? Um, all that kind of stuff is on there. And this is, I will say, a resource that the Writing Center consultants will also draw on quite a bit and they'll, they'll encourage you to use. Anything else been coming up for folks in the chat before we hop into more formal Q&A portion? We have one from Kalpana, reading yeah. books on writing with a link. Mm -hmm. Perfect, I have not seen this before, but I think that would be great. Yeah, feel free to, you know, if anybody else has had a book that is really helping them through this process, if you wanna share that in the chat, please feel free to go for it. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that they say, I say is one that I would like to highlight, um, but please feel free to highlight others as well. And, and that can be something else, again, where talking with your advisor or talking with other professors in your program can be helpful, especially like, you know, I would say for programs where writing has not been the main topic of discussion um, for your program, for most of it, like trying to open those conversations can be really helpful because your professors most likely do have to write sometimes. And so they will have opinions about how to go about some of this stuff or resources that they themselves draw on if you get them in that conversation a little bit more. Um, so I think I figured out how to launch a poll. <laughs> and and be, so before we go into the formal Q&A and also going back to that question that was posed to us in the chat, if y'all don't mind, I'm going to hit launch polling. And if you could answer for us, what is your academic college at UTEP? I think that'll be interesting to see what mix of students we have with us today. So here we go. Let's see. And we'll give you just maybe 20 seconds. OK. 
Okay, I see some responses coming in. We got some variety here. This is great. Yeah, yeah. So are you all seeing the results in real time on your screen? Okay, thanks for those votes. Oh, I, maybe if we end polling, they might see. But yeah, we're, we're getting a variety of responses. Yeah, or we can share the results. There we go. Nice. Okay. Can you see it now? Do you see it now? We can. Thank <laughs> you, Justin. Okay, great. Yeah, so wide variety. Whoop. College of Liberal Arts represent. Good job, everybody. Mm -hmm. We're big writing nerds over here. It's a good time. Okay. Um, but yeah, to start us off with Q&A, Shannon, you said that there was a message that you got earlier in the session. Is that right? Yeah, let me go ahead and read this out to you. So here's the question. And it's a good one. It's a tough one. <laughs> How long should it take me to write my proposal? I'm not sure if I'm stuck in analysis paralysis or if it just takes really long to do. That is a great question. And I would say it depends, but let's, let's go into more detail than that. Um, any advice about how and where to secure an editor? We'll get to that in just a second, Pamela, thank you. So with this question in terms of like how long to write a proposal, it, I think that's something that your department should be helping you set in some way, or your advisor should also be helping you set in terms of a timeline, because this should be part of the larger work of um, your thesis or dissertation, right? And so the proposal for folks who are unfamiliar is a formal step in the process in which you have gathered enough research to kind of justify like here are the general research questions that I would like to pursue, here are the methods that I'm going to go about uh, pursuing them with. And so it's the formal justification to kind of start the, the original research that you were conducting. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've, I've certainly had anecdotes from people where that can take quite a while. And I think some programs set it up so that it's a large part of the process that you're really thinking through several sections of what will end up being your final uh, writing while you're working on that. And other people are like, this is really loose. We really want to get through this quickly so that you can get into some other aspects of it. Um, I would say for the analysis paralysis piece where you're just like, I have a lot of ideas here and I'm not sure what to do to put them down. This is also where the writing center can be helpful in terms of like drafting something out. Or I would just say even like the very simple exercise of like writing out like what are the three big ideas that I'm exploring or whatever number of ideas that I'm really boiling down and trying to explore here and getting back to that part in terms of like, what are the research questions and just sort of moving forward with that identifying basically what components of this can I keep writing about in other stages of this work versus now. And remember with thesis and dissertation kind of stuff, the work doesn't have to end with that product, right? Like the dissertation does not have to be the last time you touch this topic. This can be the start of other research for you or other parts of your career where you will continue to think about this. So some of it may be something that you even need to push off for later projects in your career. Um, but yeah, boiling it down to it depends, work with your advisor on it. And if you're needing to do a lot of the personal work yourself for that, um, I would encourage some self-reflection to just really boil it down to the essence and kind of get going there. That's excellent advice. I would add just one additional thing. A really good piece of advice I got from my mentor when I was in graduate school was to remember that when you're, especially when you're writing your proposal and you have lots of ideas flying through your head, you don't have to lose them. Not everything is going to go into your final project, but keep a file where you put ideas for later. They're going to become articles. They'll become a collaborative project that you work on, depending on your field. I'm an art historian. Maybe it becomes an exhibition. Nothing, nothing is lost. So that can be stressful when you think, oh God, I have to get it all in there. I can't miss out on this wonderful source I just found. Just remember and have that repository somewhere in a file, whether it's electronic or it's a notebook. Just hold on to those because you will come back to them later and they'll be productive for your work. Absolutely. Um, and so to, so to turn to Pamela's question on any advice about how and where to secure an editor. So by editor, we can mean a couple different things. So I'm going to take this in a couple different ways. Um, by editor, you might just mean like somebody who's really helping you with like uh, that proofreading and polish kind of stuff or helping you like index things and a couple of things like that. That is that may not require somebody who is a specialist in your field um, to work on those sorts of aspects, in which case the writing center actually has some references for you about people that you could turn to. Um, 
or frankly, like Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace might have a couple folks as just general ideas. This is not a professional service as far as I'm aware that UTEP offers. And so it would be looking more for a one-on-one -on -one kind of like person who does that in a freelance kind of way. If you're looking for editor in the sense of like converting this project into a publishable format or somebody to help you with like um, discipline specific formatting or citation concerns, then you know, I would encourage you to reach out to a professional listserv and ask if anybody has worked with an editor and explain the kind of editing work that you're looking for. Um, congrats, it's great. I may have a 45 page paper, may publish. So if you're looking for publishing that in a journal or something as well, you may just end up working with that journal itself. And so look for the appropriate venue for publishing, may have a sense of like their expectations for an editor. Um, but those are the initial ideas. So just to review like, Writing Center for really generalist editing. Um, they'll have references for professionals that you can go to if you want that dedicated one-on-one -on -one process. Um, and then if you are looking for more specialist work, um, either talking to your department in case anybody else has any anecdotal information, reaching out to professional listservs and explaining the kind of editing work that you want and if anybody has any references um, or seeking out a particular journal if you're looking to publish something in some way. Does that give uh, an idea? Okay, great. Wonderful, Pamela. Um, are there any other questions coming up right now? Not at this second, but I'm sure people are thinking and typing. And yeah. I, they would echo in your uh, feedback to, to Pamela's question that your professional listservs are a really great resource. I'm noticing that particularly in this time, a lot of uh, recent PhDs are kind of going into consulting service. I just saw a message to my one of my professional listservs last week. And so those can be a really good way if you're looking for more specialized editing like that that you describe. So you can find, um, contact someone, see what their services are like, what their rates are like, and just explore a bit beyond talking to your program. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so we, we have a little bit of questions in chat about the University Writing Center a bit more. Um, so just to clarify the conversation from the chat right now, there's no in-person service for the Writing Center this year. It's located in the library, so that would alone, the traffic for that would be difficult, along with, because it's one-on-one -on -one close work, there's really no way to do that uh, with the safety precautions we need to be taking right now. Um, and so it's fully online. I included the link to the UWC, and as Vivian, who's a consultant there right now, is explaining, um, there's an online system for live, like one-on-one uh, -on -one work, or if you want to like drop it off, quote unquote, through email and get some comments in a couple days that are again, not entirely geared towards it as a proofreading surface service so much as like working with you to get tools to work on your writing. Is there anything else coming up right now? There is one quick wrap up um, thing that I wanted to just prompt you all for to kind of think about. This is a way that I like to wrap up workshops in general, and this is the notion um, of stop, start, and continue. So this is a very basic kind of wrap-up activity where I ask you to commit to one thing that you would stop based off of what you've heard in this workshop, one thing that you want to start doing, and one thing that you would like to continue doing. So this is reflection for yourself if you'd like. If you want to commit to something in chat, you are welcome to so that other people see and share that. And then I encourage you to, you know, because we're all graduate students and a lot of you are probably running presentations at various points in your life. I'm very fond of this activity. I think it translates well in a lot of different environments to help people prompt around like, oh, what did I actually get out of this session? Like what, what are things that I wanna actually start doing as a result of this? So again, that's just one thing you're stopping, one thing you're gonna start, one thing you wanna continue. I love that exercise. Um, Takami asks, how do you write a professional paper with research where you have to cite sources while also giving your own required critical flexion without writing in first person? I would say work in the humanities where we can do first person. No, um, at stay in your discipline, it's fun. Um, I would say that this is where that familiarization with the genre can be really helpful, right? So start seeking out things in your field or writing on similar subjects with similar methodological approaches to yours and look at the kind of writing moves that they make in this regard. Do they talk about themselves as the researchers did blank? 
Um, or do they say um, several problems that came up during the research were blank and this kind of thing. See basically what your field is already doing to work through this kind of conundrum because I assure you somebody else has run into this kind of issue before in your field. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> I believe that brings us to time, and I definitely know that everybody is busy, so I don't want us to run over if we don't have to. Mm -hmm. I can linger for a few minutes for sure if people still have questions, um, but is there anything else that we wanted to go over, Shannon? I think we are at perfect time, and we got in a great final question. I would, okay, so Pamela's asking, is it okay to email you later if needed? Yes, I am sharing my email in the chat right now. Um, I'll just say it out loud in case anybody reads the recording. tavandyke at minors.utep.edu. Yes, and let me also provide our general graduate school professional development and outreach email in case you'd like to contact the graduate school with any other questions about workshops, resources, you're welcome to contact us. But thank you, Turnip, for providing your email. That's wonderful. And thank you so much for leading an amazing workshop today. I'm really happy that we got to do this together. And I look forward to further collaborations. To our participants, I want to also let you know that you'll be hearing from us. We'll be sending you a little feedback survey, and we would really appreciate your feedback on today's workshop, any ideas that came to mind, things you might like to see in other professional development workshops, we love to hear from you and respond to that as we can. So stay tuned to your email in the next 24 hours or so. All right, so let me just post that email here. And thanks once again to Turnip, thanks to my colleagues in the graduate school. I see we have our associate dean, Dr. Dudar here with us as well waving in the corner and thanks to everyone for spending this hour and change with us we we love to see your faces and hear you a bit in this time so take thank you. care thank you so much and thank virtual so clapping much. thank you take care everyone take care everyone you too, you too. thank you thank you Hey. That went well. Thank you so much. That was great. Thanks. Here, let me. You saw